Hello and welcome to We Are Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I will be your host for this evening. Now, joining me today is a gentleman who has had... Um, He's well known within the games industry. He has recently, well, not that recently now, joined the ranks yeah. of Steamforge Games. Um, he is the bearer of the curse. And if you know the Dark Souls games yeah. at all, there you go. Do you know what I mean? Seek souls, seek powerful souls. I'm joined by DC, or David Carl, or the Emperor of Game Design. As he told me. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> no, that's not the right name. So, I just happen to have a picture of me in the Emperor's chair at Comic Con. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> he said distinctly that I was allowed to call him DC four times, and then he would close down the podcast. That was kind of. And unless I call him directly as um, your lord <laughs> or anything like that. Otherwise, it's. No, I'm only joking. It's. Listen, good evening. Good evening, DC. It's excellent to have you on thank you for coming on good evening thanks for letting me join you oh it's 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 good as i was saying um we've been there's been a story and a journey about us kind of finally talking which i'm not going to tell here because it takes too long and i talk too much as it is um so tonight we are going to talk a bit about steam forged we're gonna talk a little Mm -hmm. bit about your past as well because um one of the things we like to do in We Are Not Wizards is we like to kind of delve into somebody's past, have a little kind of look around in the present, and then kind of stare off into the future. So oh, That's uh, a great way to put there it. There you go. Now, the reason that we do this um, is quite simply because we don't think there's enough podcasts out there about board games. I know it's been the same joke for the last 75-odd so episodes, but it's good, and we're keeping it. And the other reason that we do this is quite simply because I wanted to speak to DC from Steamforge Games about the Dark Souls board game and other things. So there we go. So, again, thank you for coming on. But do you want to start off maybe by... um, you want to tell us a little bit about your history um, involved in the kind of the hobby, if you don't mind? Well, I grew up in a fairly sheltered home and wasn't really exposed to a lot of kind of hobby games of any kind as a kid. Uh, I was involved in in chess and other kind of traditional games, but uh, to fill that itch I didn't even know was missing in my life, I started making games of my own. I would uh, grab some toys and find dice in different games and put them all together and assign different dice to different toys mm-hmm. and force my dad to play these horrible miniatures games with me. Uh, did you give them names? Force... Did you have a name? Uh, game or did you? I was more focused on the rules at the time. Uh-huh. Their names were exciting things like tank and helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> and how old were you at the time when you were doing this? Uh, I mean, that one, that stuff might have been around kind of eight or nine sort of time frame when I was one of those scary little kids playing chess against adults and beating them. (laughs) But I also would uh, get involved in what I didn't even know were role playing games and force my brother into playing those with me, my kid brother. And it was just something that was kind of in my DNA before I even really understood what any of these things were. Mm hmm. And then in college, uh, I found Hobby Miniatures games. Yeah. Uh, and I had also been getting more involved in kind of the more the more hobbyish board games as well, both in high school and through college. Things that were a bit more off the beaten path, not the kind of stuff that you just find in a regular store, but in, in a gaming store. Uh, and started getting more involved in, in various things. I uh, played some, some Warhammer 40k yeah, for a yeah. while. Um, and then... I guess things really kind of took off when I was getting more and more involved in in my local card game community, role playing game community, uh, miniatures game community, and eventually started doing a little bit of game design on the side. Right. Um, is that your is that a, your kind of your profession? Is that what you kind of trained to do? Was kind of game design, or did you kind of no, fall into it? Uh, my my degrees are in electrical engineering and mathematics. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I was a power and controls engineer. Okay. And in college, the focus in uh, electrical engineering is very heavily on merging the creativity and the analytical side of 
of what we study and who we are. Uh, but in corporate engineering, it's all about just kind of doing things as efficiently as possible, not really looking into the creative side of things very much, unless you're in R and D. Yeah. Uh, and I was I was not in R and D, so the the creative side of my brain was looking for an outlet, mm-hmm. and, and I found the gaming stuff. So I uh, helped with some game development work on a card game from a very small company nearby, and yeah. was helping with some RPG adventures, and uh, it all just kind of kind of grew from there. In I want to say it was about. 2003 when war machine was starting to really hit the scene yeah yeah i got uh heavily involved with those guys as a play tester as a volunteer Mm -hmm. as a writer for their magazine um was one of the play test group leads for one of the most active groups in the world at the time and before too long uh i kind of was getting more and more tired of the the engineering thing and then in 2008 went and joined privateer press full-time that must was that that must have been a decision and a half to kind of make because that was only that wasn't even kind of 10 years ago well just almost 10 years ago now so i'm guessing you would have had potentially responsibilities and things like that that you would have had to be looking after or taking care of so was it a big decision at the time or was it a case of this is the easiest decision i'm ever gonna have to make in my life kind of thing well i am extremely fortunate in that i chose the right wife okay Uh, i've been married to jess now for over 18 years already kind of dating myself with that one (laughs) um Although not her, because <laughs> up until recently she was telling people she was only 29, really? but that gets a little weird eventually. I take it she not, she's, she's not, not in the really room 29. at the moment. <laughs> no, no. That's okay. I don't think anybody else is going to hear this anyway, so it's fine. Only the everybody that listens when they hear that you're on a show. So, <laughs> Well, the millions and millions of your fans are all going to hear it. <laughs> yeah. There's going to be words in the car, DC. You know this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I came back to her and said, you know, uh, Privateer Press wants me to come on full time. But at, at that point, we lived in St. Louis hmm. and Privateer Press is all the way over in Bellevue, Washington. And I want to say that's something like 2,000 miles. Yeah. Um, so, like, I don't know how many laps that is. That's a rough commute. I mean, around, just like, around Scotland there. <laughs> that's, a, that's, like a, that's like the whole of the U.K., you know, the UK is about seven. Yeah, how many laps around the UK probably. to get 2,000 miles? I, I wouldn't, wouldn't want... To, I'm going to show my ignorance, have a guess. Probably about at least one. One and a bit. <laughs> at least one, At least sure. one. <laughs> you know, I'm just going off for a, a 2,000 mile jog. Um, yeah. But yeah, that would have been a so commute I, and a half. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I came to her and said, you know, I I know that the, the money in this isn't as good... Mm. I know it's far away and we'd be uprooting our whole lives. You'd have to find a new job. And she immediately said, no, you you have to do it. You've been trying to do this for years now. You've been doing the freelance and contract thing uh, for almost a decade at that point. She's like, you have to take this opportunity. Mm-hmm. And, and so I did. And I wound up joining Privateer Press just as the playtest coordinator for all of their playtest programs. Yeah. Uh, within a few months, they had promoted me to game developer. Wow. And after about a year, they had promoted me to development manager of Privateer Press. So what does a development manager do? Because if you, if I said, you know, I'm um, speaking to John Gilmore, who is a designer, people will go, yep, okay, I have an idea. He's the guy there. He gets the white pieces of paper. And then he writes stuff down and he sees if it works and it's fun and it's enjoyable. You, that sound, you sound like this is involving kind of more kind of figures and numbers and making sure kind of stuff works and I mean what 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 what's your kind of your your what was your kind of role there what were you doing yeah i I think you explained it quite well there the game design side of things mm. is coming up with a lot of ideas mm-hmm. getting kind of that big picture view what sort of game are we making what are the characters involved the main storyline kind of that initial concept uh, and then game development which typically takes 
it depends on the game, but typically takes far longer, especially when we're talking about miniatures games yeah. or really heavy board games. A lot goes into designing the individual cards, making sure the balance is right, making massive spreadsheets of things. Um, so as the head of game development, I oversaw that, or the development manager, mm. I oversaw that process for several other game developers at the company and over a lot of different game lines. So most of what Privateer Press put out between about 2008 and uh, 2015, I was at least somewhat involved in the development of those projects. Mm -hmm. Is there anything from Privateer Press that you're really kind of proud of that you were um, kind of like, yeah, that you've, you would put on your CV in kind of bold letters and kind of highlight? Um, I would say that the work I did on certain War Machine and Hordes books, yeah. uh, there was a time period there where Jason Souls, the uh, lead designer of War Machine and Hordes, was kind of focused a bit more on the Iron Kingdom's role-playing game for a while. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I had a, a bit more free reign at the time than I was used to having yeah, okay. with uh, being able to do a bit more of the design work for a little while, mm -hmm. as well as development work and also just having a bit more freedom even within the development to kind of break a few rules to make new stuff that i thought was neat <laughs> and, uh it just had a really good time with it uh we put out several great books during the time period as well as putting out a new faction the convergence of cirrus all right okay which was kind of this uh mechanica faction of stuff and with having such a background in in engineering and mathematics, being able to really dive into these clockwork machines and their uh, their philosophy, their society, them as an army was just so much fun. And I was really proud of what we were able to put out there. And I know there's a lot of fans of Convergence around the world who've enjoyed playing that faction. Cool. I was expecting you to say I, I put out this game and I call it Tank kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I I did have an to idea, uh, guys. do some research for better learning. <laughs> yeah, better naming. Excuse me. I just think that would be so funny. Um, but I mean, so you're you're kind of you're unleashed, and you're able to get more involved in the creative the creative kind of process during the time. Yeah. I mean, are you are you still playing as much, or or do you kind of step away from the playing side of things? Are you kind of? I take it if you're in your role. You have to kind of be aware of what the competition are kind of putting out, or changes to well, their yeah, rules you, and stuff. You certainly like that. should be. Yeah, yeah. It's important to stay connected enough to truly understand uh, the people out there playing your game. Mm -hmm. uh, my background before going to Privateer Press was as a tournament War Machine player, yeah. uh, among other things. But uh, going to lots of major events and. Once you're doing it day in and day out, there's just not as much time mm -hmm. to to travel to lots of big tournaments and things. And uh, different companies have different policies on whether or not you're even allowed to play in tournaments. Yeah, I um, guess. So that can make it tougher too. Um, but I was definitely trying to stay very rooted in the community and in what was going on, understand what what elements of the game were, were currently too strong, yeah. what stuff could be brought up a little bit, and... Uh, just really trying to understand what the organized play stuff should look like and what any changes to the rules should be at any given time. So, yeah, it's definitely important to to stay grounded and to stay involved. Do you think that's because a part of what you, you've done before is kind of like running the playtest group, so that's still kind of a focus for you. It was still kind of quite important. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that the various elements of the background I've had really kind of come together mm -hmm. uh, in a in a positive way to to make me the game developer I am currently mm -hmm. uh, e even little things like once I eventually did leave privateer press uh, I did the freelance thing once again but from a different perspective from the standpoint of having all these industry contacts mm -hmm. by that point mm -hmm. and uh, I made a card game with Ninja Division. I made a card game with Steamforged Games. All right, yeah, okay. Uh, I continued working with Privateer Press on some contract stuff. Uh -huh. uh, and I branded myself Clockwork Phoenix Games. Uh, and you can still find my attempts at doing a podcast online and blog articles and 
uh, a small Kickstarter project, just kind of trying to to spread my wings and see what else I could do. Mm-hmm. But uh, then I got the proverbial offer you can't refuse. <laughs> well, I mean, how how did that kind of... I mean, you said you mentioned, obviously, you helped Steamforge with... Um, with the card, with their card game, so how did that? Did you just get like the call um, to say, "Hey, what are you up to, DC?" Or well, near enough. <laughs> uh, I worked on the card game called Shadow Games. Yeah. It is a a bluffing game that uh, has elements where it really encourages you to bluff. It rewards you for bluffing, uh, not just uh, catching other people when they try to bluff. So I think it really. Uh, it was a fun game that I enjoyed making, and I enjoyed working with Matt and Rich on it. Uh, and they said in uh, early 2016, they said, we're going to have this big meetup for the Dark Souls Kickstarter. Yeah. And we're bringing in our internal developers, which at the time it was Matt, Rich, and Jamie. Yeah. But we also want to bring in uh, Bryce Johnston, who had been doing rules work for Guild Ball in the Lawyers Guild. Yeah. And we want to bring in uh, Alex Hall, who'd been helping them on the Kickstarter with comments and stuff, and was a Dark Souls super fan. <laughs> with, uh, I think he had something like four hundred seventy thousand hours of Dark Souls that he had played. That's just that's that's. I mean, that's, I'm exaggerating a little. Yeah, bit. I mean, that's probably he's like a part timer. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. There, there'll be guys that can go oh, for uh, rubbish. <laughs> I bet you didn't use the build where he went round the game just fighting people with a banana. I did that kind of thing. With a banana? But yeah, it's there. That's not true. That's a lie. No, that's a lie. That's a clear. That's a barefaced lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you imagine the banana build. There you go. Think about yeah. it. No, well, that's an expansion. There's your first. Well, there's one of several expansions that you could um, potentially be. Kind of thinking about. I mean, did I'll keep it in mind. I, I, I you know, I think that's. I'll, I'll send you um, a one-line email to remind you at the end of this. Just, just you know, to keep it there. But um, sounds good. <laughs> what a, we better step back, otherwise we're going down nonsense, Phil. And then we're both going to do emperor impressions, and then it's just going to turn oh, into. Oh no, like, <laughs> yours is too much better than mine. I don't want to go down that road. <laughs> So, so they're kind of assembling this team, uh, almost like the beginning of the superhero movie where yeah. you, you get the team together, uh-huh. and uh, they brought me in for my board game experience uh, at Privateer Press, and uh, a little bit in other situations, but mostly with things that I'd worked on mm. at Privateer, uh, and said, hey, you know board games, you know Dark Souls, you know our Guild Ball community, yeah. uh, and just kind of did this assembling the team, and we all went to this little cottage in the countryside of England. All right, okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just sat down with with what they had at the time, which was basically just kind of the the stuff that was on Kickstarter, the the tech demo sort of look at what a boss fight could be. Yeah. Uh, And that evolved a lot over the course of that week uh, and continued to evolve a bit afterwards even. Uh, And we looked at what the encounters should look like and... And we really uh, did kind of a deep dive on the characters. How do we make the characters true to Dark Souls, mm. but also sufficiently distinct that they appeal to board gamers as unique characters? Uh, and just so many different elements of it. And that week just kind of flew by. And at the end of it, kind of determined that Alex Hall and I would would kind of form the the polar opposites of this team that would then the kind of lead the Dark Souls development moving forward okay. uh, as other people return to uh, their work on Guild Ball and other things. Yeah. And uh, he had that powerful game knowledge and I had the board game development knowledge and and we put that together and here we are <laughs> a year and a half later. Dark Souls, the core game for Dark Souls is already out. Yeah. Uh, the expansions are... Uh, in the process of, of being produced and will go out hopefully soon. And then we've got yet more expansions in the work even after that. Yeah. So, yeah, turned out to be a great partnership. Did you, I mean, did you play Dark Souls yourself at all? Uh, before the yeah. uh, announcement that I was going to go on this trip, yeah. I had not played it at all. 
it wasn't the type of game that really draws me in. I usually lean more towards the turn-based yeah. type stuff. Strategy games, role-playing games, but more along turn-based lines where I can plan out my moves and stuff. But uh, once I found out I was going, I did pick up Dark Souls and, and, and got to experience that you die screen <laughs> about, you know, whatever it is, five times a minute or something for as long as you play. It's yeah, I mean it's um it's kind of an experience. Well <clears throat> I guess my interest in this is the um the fact that you were people have talked about you know, the board game community and the video game community. They're very different they can be very, very different things. And one thing that I noticed the about the Dark Souls board game was it brought these two communities kinda crashing together kinda headlong. I don't th- I yeah. don't remember seeing a kind of another game doing that because I I know um you know um I mentioned to you that um you know my mate um Paddy um Paddy Smith from Twin Humanities um mm-hmm. he does the darks he does the darks dark dark souls po- podcast you know um there's another friend Jeremy Greer the he does a he does an entire show called Don't Give Up Skeleton and that is about getting people on the show and they just talk about the Dark Souls experience. I mean, quite recently there's been a a long-running show called Bonfireside Chat, which mm. is about, you know, it's um, it's Gary and Cole. We're talking about, you know, everything from Dark Souls all the way through to Bloodborne to Dark Souls 3 yeah. and then did the whole thing. So it's a massive, huge kind of community. When you were <clears throat> When you were sitting on the precipice of this, and you were saying, I'm going to do Dark Souls. Were you also thinking, I'm going to do Dark Souls? Was there, <laughs> was there any of that to it at all? Well, I, I love the, the word that you used, crashing together. <laughs> yeah. I really do. Because early on in the process, uh, coming from such different backgrounds, Alex and I really did crash together in a couple of ways. <laughs> and... I'm not saying that in a negative way at all. No. It was kind of the 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 growing pains of what I think turned into just such a perfect team uh, relationship there. Mm. Such a good dynamic of give and take. But he would always approach it from, we need to do this yeah. for the Dark Souls community. And I would say, well, we need to do this for the board game community. <laughs> um, and some of it, we wound up eventually going kind of in the direction that he originally proposed or the direction I originally proposed. Uh But far more often than not, we would find some road down the middle where we could balance out the simulationist element for Dark Souls uh, players out there around the world and the abstractionist element that appeals more to board game players and dungeon crawl players Uh and Uh co-op gamers who maybe have never even seen Dark Souls. Uh, and so being able to bring those two together and find a middle ground, a common ground, that would then be the right solution for the game. Yeah, but I mean, you could have done the easy option. I mean, there would have been, let's face it, the I know a lot of people that have bought the Dark Souls board game and they bought it for one reason and one reason only is because of the echo bitty miniatures, basically. Yeah, you know, they're yeah. ordering everything because they're going to have, they've got a little Smo, they've got a little Ornstein, they're going to have a Sif. They're going to have an Artorius. They're going to have, you know, they're going to have the four kings on their mantelpiece or in a display case, and they're fully kind of, you know, they're fully kind of painting them up. So there are, there, you know, there's that side of the people that just want it for the game. So there was nothing technically stopping you from saying, okay, you move, here you go, let's do a grid, and you move four spaces, or you here's your movement. If you're a herald, you move up to six. If you're a dexterity guy, like a thief, you can move up to eight. If you're a knight or a t- you know a tank kind of character, you can move mm-hmm. three spaces. And then here's your dice, here's your rolling. You could have done a, a very simple kind of roll, fight, descent type game, imperial assault type game. Except you, it's really clear that you guys, you were like, nah, we're we've got to make this kind of as close to the kind of the dark as Dark Souls as we as we kind of can. As Dark Soulsy, yes, yeah, that was a word that came up a lot. Yeah, well, that's yeah. not Dark Soulsy no, enough. Exactly, we have to make this part more Dark Soulsy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, even down to when you open the box for the first time, and there's like, oh the, yeah, there's like the 
I think I I think there's there's a couple of times I've opened the box on a board game and and kind of let out a kind of oh this is cool. One of them was when um I think when I when I opened up Mechs versus Minions for the first oh, time. Such a good game. And um and I was just like I I just closed the box again and then I opened it up again so I could have it. Yep, yep. <laughs> and then I closed it again <laughs> and then I opened it up and I says I I this isn't what that you know it's I was is this a video game company making a board game and they're doing this right. can more video game companies make board games please but then the other thing was when you were opening up the Dark Souls box for the first time and then on the top um is that message and I'm sure people that you know everybody's play but there is the message the famous message from Dark Souls at the top when you open up and it kind of there was that kind of well what I'm expecting to see oh I'm expecting to see this this is this is um, this is mm-hmm. good fun this kind of sets my my kind of mind at, mind at rest um <clears throat> the game got also a lot of coverage from the video game media as well cuz I mean I think yeah it, I mean, you probably had... Well, I know that you had a lot of video game press coverage. You know, your Kotaku's of this world and Rock, Paper, Shotgun and every single mainstream bit of media was wanting to grab a piece of the kind of the Steamforged kind of pie. Um, I take it you, you kind of expected that to kind of happen, I guess. Well, I mean, we knew that it was kind of one of the best examples of bringing together two... Mm-hmm large but different communities Mm. so we had guys whose background is more in the gaming world in miniatures games and board games and card games Mm. Uh, i remember an early team covenant uh interview and video that went really well and then all the way on the opposite side of the spectrum you've got uh, interviews and articles like polygon yeah uh who don't typically cover no. card games or miniatures games no. or board games they're focused on the video games so yeah we knew it was going to be bringing different groups together and we also knew that that meant there was even more pressure to <laughs> get that balance right <laughs> to really nail the right mix yeah. of that video game experience and that board game experience to create the uh hopefully fun but true to the game dungeon crawler that we've got today Mm -hmm. so did you uh, you obviously you didn't um you didn't stay in you stayed in the states to develop your side of the game and the guys they were in because they work in england as well don't they or the uk yeah Yeah. home base is manchester Yeah, yeah yeah so was that kind of was that kind of an interesting dynamic to kind of have the discussions, the meetings, kind of different time zones and stuff like that? Yeah, that's an interesting one that you bring up because uh, when I started, I was still in Bellevue, Washington, yeah, uh, which is where Privateer Press was based. It's also where Microsoft is based. Mm. Um, so my wife and I were already kind of thinking about moving. Yeah. And the fact that the work day for the guys in England was the equivalent of 1 a.m. to 9 a.m. Seattle time yeah. made me uh, not want to live there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've done, um, I've done a couple of interviews before with people in um, the, that, you know, kind of the, the I guess the, um, what you would call the sunny West Coast. And um, yeah. Yeah, that's always been interesting to try and sort out. It's like, well, you're going to bed when I'm getting up kind of thing. So how are we going right. to work this? So yeah. it's always been like a, a kind of in the morning. So you must, I take it that obviously meant, well, let's let's move and make this kind of easier for ourselves. Yeah, we, we were about ready to move anyway. Mm. We wanted uh, to live in an area with a better uh, cost of living. Yeah be able to to get a nicer house and less traffic and that kind of stuff is even outside of the job part of things yeah, but yeah. then we said well if we put it on the east coast that'll save me three hours and every time when i wake up the guys it'll be there afternoon yeah. we can talk for for three or four hours get a lot of work done yeah. and kind of say break at the end of their day and i can get more work done without any interruptions uh, so that just worked out really nicely and we also wanted an airport that was nice and convenient. Just had a convenient little just over an hour flight to and from Gen Con. It's got direct flights to London. So we are now in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. All right, okay. That's nice. So it's just it's easy. 
I mean, this is yeah. the commute is very, very simple. Then, if you're, I suppose, if you are planning to fly, I mean, it must, you know, there will be kind of the the, the other development meetings, I guess, where you kind of had to have them. I guess you had to kind of have them face to face. Um, yeah, well, which we'll still do. Mm. Like when we do, uh, especially when we're in the early stages of development, we really want to hammer out aspects of how the game will play. Yeah. We like to still get a group together and work through pieces of what the game should look like. Mm-hmm. Is the was there a massive difference between the game that you started off with at the beginning and the finished the kind of the product that was going out to all these backers? Uh, I would say yes. Yeah, uh, I I think that the method that Steam Forged Games uses mm-hmm. is kind of that original concept, that original. Uh, goal of kickstarter where you present an idea and then you gauge the interest and you see what people are really looking for and you actually use those comments that feedback to craft the final game Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and some companies do that uh some companies use kickstarter more as like almost like a pre-order system yeah and you know there's there's nothing that says you can't do that but but i I really like the process of being able to say here's this game idea Mm. let's almost see where we wind up uh the early demos for dark souls if if anyone remembers those earliest videos uh you could use each weapon uh, as many times as you wanted as long as you spent stamina uh, that that changed a lot. Uh, the characters and the way some of the character stuff worked changed a lot. Yeah. Uh, it didn't have any sort of stat system or weapon system at the time for what things you could and couldn't use. Yeah. There was no encounter system at all, no uh, character differentiation. There were so, so, so many elements that still needed to be designed, and that's what that design week for, was for in the cabin. Yeah, yeah. And then even once they were designed, so many elements still to develop. <gasps> all the different enemies, all the different boss behaviors, the encounters, the treasure. Oh, the treasure spreadsheet. It is a big one, <laughs> let me tell you. I have to ask the question, okay, when you were thinking about, you're, you've, you're, you're putting the campaign together, and people are like, when's this launching? When's this launching? Need, I need my Dark Souls. Give me my Dark Souls board game kind of thing. Did you have... And I've joked with this before about other guests. Because when we had Jeremy Greer on and you know people like that, they've been our big parts of the Dark Souls community. Did you have a big white board with lots of post-it notes with all the stretch goals on it? And did you run out of post-it notes as you were thinking about the stretch goals? <laughs> Now, that is an excellent question. Unfortunately, it's more of a Matt and Rich question than a me question. Because remember, uh, Bryce, Alex, and I were brought in kind of once the campaign was was finishing up yeah. to do the design work in the cabin. Yeah. So I, I know we had many, many post-it notes and <laughs> whiteboard scribbles and giant pieces of paper with marker all over them on the floor. <laughs> Uh, d- while we were at the cabin, yeah. so I can only imagine that yeah, it was a a similar experience in creating the the stretch goals initially, yeah. as well as then figuring out how all these pieces <laughs> fit together. Uh, and you you make a good point about stretch goals. Uh, Kickstarter projects can sometimes be the victim of their own success. Yeah, uh, you wind up where the main pledge includes so many extra things that. It, it it winds up not being nearly as profitable as you initially thought no, it was going to be. No. It's a delicate balance. Yeah. No, Jamie Stegmaier, um, when I had him on the show, he said there is a yeah. point where there is no difference between you ordering 15,000 pieces of something and 25,000 pieces of something because the factory just cannot do it any cheaper for you. You've reached your kind right. of your cost, your kind of, your cost kind of uh, the minimum cost floor. And you know that's yep. when it starts to exactly you know, right. You know that's when it starts to kind of, uh, you know, you're plateauing. So this is when you have to make some kind of design decisions about what materials you're kind of going to be going to be using. So right, but the community doesn't want to hear, and we're done. No more stretch goals. No, like that's that doesn't go over well. No, I've seen. Um, I think I've seen a couple of campaigns. More, I think, um, kind of medium campaigns where. They've they've all stretched out and went like, listen guys, thank you, this is fantastic, and somehow they've they've been lucky because they've managed to kind of hit 
the right stretch goal like three days before they finish. So they just say, listen, guys, victory lap, lap time. You know, we'll make sure that we add a little bonus something. You all get a nice kind of little kind of... Um, you get a nice little stickered meeple or you'll get like a thank you note, you know, from my mum for saying thanks for backing <laughs> this kind of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, you guys, I mean, the stretch goals were just unlocking and unlocking and unlocking. I mean, the campaign went... I don't think anybody didn't expect it to fund very, very well. I think people were very surprised about how far it kind of actually went. Yeah. Because it went on to... You know, cool mini, cool mini or not, must have been sitting there going, "This is my show. This is my show. Nobody touch our millions." <laughs> and then all of a sudden, they're like, "That's Steam. Who are they? Steam Forge? Oh, they did uh, Guild Ball, right? Well, they're doing millions, kind of thing." Um, yeah, I don't think anyone would disagree that no. it exceeded <laughs> expectations. It really just kind of blew those expectations away. And then the campaign ends, and you're kind of brought in, and then. How many spreadsheets did you have to open on the first day <laughs> in terms of organization? Was it 15? Uh, was it 20? A, a lot of them I wound up building myself. <laughs> <laughs> there was some information already in place, yeah. but uh, in terms of the assets needed for designing and developing the game, it was still so early. Mm. Uh, all we really had going into that week was an initial card for the dancer and some initial behavior cards Whoa. that the dancer would follow and some very very early uh herald and warrior stuff i think at the time mm. but uh yeah it it there was a lot to build we we had some some early just like listings of all the different equipment and then we started parsing it out into what goes in the core set what goes in which expansion here mm. and uh just kind of how do we bridge the gap between what does a mini boss look like versus a main boss well what about this thing called a mega boss yeah. how do we make them different how do we make them cohesive mm. so that you're following the same rules mm. but still exciting when you try a new boss there's a lot to figure out a lot to do and a lot of spreadsheets <laughs> was it did it some did it all of a sudden move from being kind of yeah let's uh was it starting off like 16 hour days where you had to go straight into it and kind of get as much stuff kind of organized as possible or are you a planner and you were like nope start at nine finish at five and then we're done kind of thing um the the week in the cabin was definitely some pretty long days uh. getting a lot of design work done all at once uh. when we first got back things kind of hit a fairly uh measured pace for a while the times where we hit real crunch periods were eh, as it always is is when something comes due because even if your development work is already in time maybe there was some sort of a delay uh in the editing process mm. or maybe there was some sort of delay in graphic design yeah or, or maybe we are running a little late yeah uh and then you've really got to push through and get it done get all the proofing done mm. get all the uh Make sure that everything looks like what it's supposed to. Yeah. Make sure that all of the edits that have been made get put into the cards correctly. And like, there's just a lot there at the end when you hit those steps. Uh, or there can be a lot when you hit a certain convention point. Uh, right before SteamCon of last year, the Steamforged Games convention, yeah. I know Alex was putting in just tons of time on making sure all of the, the demo materials were ready. Everything was as strong as it could possibly be to truly represent the game we'd created uh and his passion was there but i i think i think we might have burnt him out a little bit at that <laughs> point in time just because there was so much that kind of fell on his shoulders with me not being in town in manchester yeah when how much involvement was there from like fromsoft themselves i mean did you I mean, did you ever get a chance to kind of dialogue with, you know, with Miyazaki or any of the designers from the game when you were working through your documents and stuff like that? So we could have a whole podcast about licensing and how different people approach licensing. Uh, in this particular case, most of the interaction was really based around the art side of things. Yeah. The sculptures, yeah. 
uh, of the miniatures. Uh, we had to do some some minor re-sculpts and some changes to the original sculpt that was sent in for approval. Uh-huh. Uh, that's why a lot of times when pictures were shown, it was like pending approval on the bottom. <laughs> yeah. uh, and some things changed a little bit yeah. in terms of they wanted to make sure that their characters were faithfully represented. Yeah. No. Um, but we, yeah, but we didn't have a whole lot of that on the development side of things with this particular license holder. Mm-hmm. It really just depends, though, on what people are focused on. Uh, some of them do care more about the rules. Some of them just want their paycheck, and you can do whatever you want on everything. Yeah. Uh, it just depends. Yeah. Um. I mean, I take it that did that become. As you said yourself, that came a bit, kind of became a, like an inter- more of an internal stush- discussion about people saying, you know, that well, this isn't Dark Soulsy enough, <laughs> kind of clearly. Yeah, that was very much just kind of the the give and take mm. between Alex and I. Mm. Uh, just to give one example, yeah. at one point in time, we had catalysts and spells as separate items in the treasure deck. Really? So we had outlined out which things are catalysts, uh-huh. which things are spells, which ones can you pair with each other, and it became almost a game within a game to get the right thing that could pair into the right catalyst, which would then let you cast a spell. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, nope, this is this is too cumbersome. This is almost a separate game, just making this catalyst system work. We've got to figure out a way that we can present these things, uh, but have it be more fun, more useful. And of course, we've had we had play testers on the project, mm-hmm. and we're able to get their feedback on how is this working, how is it working now. What should we change in this regard to yeah. still maintain this feeling uh, of Dark Souls, but also make it more streamlined for the board game audience? With the playtesters, did you look at scoping at people that played the game, or were you looking at people that were more experienced in the kind of the board game playtesting kind of thing? Uh, both. Yeah. Uh, and then when we get to the blind test, which is a key portion of any. Any game testing, we want people with minimal experience in Dark Souls or board games <laughs> yeah. to just kind of take the rule book, yeah. take the materials, and see if they can figure out from that how to play this game and see if they'll have a good time. Okay, okay. The game, um, there's always hurdles or there's always little kind of bumps in the road with any kind of Kickstarter. I don't think there's only mm-hmm. a couple that always kind of come in. Um, and the. One that kind of I remember was there was the translations I think, um, yeah. That, came in that kind of I think it kind of upset the apple cart a bit in terms of delivery for some people. Um, yeah, I think that one of the things to remember there is that Steamforged is still a fairly young company. Yeah, uh, we were working with a partner on the translations and. Uh, the languages that we knew, yeah. <laughs> things were looking pretty good. Yeah. Things seemed like they were on the right track, yeah. but uh, not all of the languages had been <laughs> translated as successfully yeah. as others. So we kind of had to go back in, and it, there were some growing pains. I'm not going to deny it for a second, no. but we learned from it, yeah. uh, and hopefully we'll see that it works out even smoother the next time. We'll find out pretty quickly here with... Uh, the Dark Souls card game. Yes. We will come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was... When the games were going out, I think the comment section was its funniest about the whole people trying to understand what it meant that a game was potentially on its way to them. <laughs> did you, right, did you right. see any of... <laughs> uh, I, I saw a little bit of that. I yeah. saw the kind of guys going, it's, it's just saying pending, it's... Does that mean that? Um, what does that mean? And then I also saw comments about people calling you thieves and stuff like that right, because right. the game was supposedly <laughs> on its way and they hadn't received it. And it was like, guys, chill out. You know, it's kind of like you're gonna get it in a couple of days. It was kind of yeah. I seen that. I seen that kind of that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> there, there's a, th- a lot to be said though for that passion. Yeah. Um, if nobody's excited about the game, if everyone's just kind of forgotten about it, that's no good either. No. I mean, obviously we want people to be a bit more patient than a few folks were, but overall it was just good to see that people were so interested in, in just getting the game and being able to play it. Hmm. It's the dark, I mean, it's the Dark Souls community. I mean, you're taking a much loved IP that people have 
gone as far as saying, well, listen, this game really got me into video games to this game helped me through my depression or this game helped me through my Mm. addiction or, you know, this game helped me deal with um, my grief. I know that um, I've heard people talk about Dark Souls 2 in relation to um, dealing with, like, Alzheimer's disease and, you know, there's a lovely Mm. story about that. So it's, I mean, there's a there's a lot of love to going on there, and and you know, obviously the distance between love and hate is actually usually smaller than what kind of kind of people think. Um, well, it's passion. Yeah, I know. Whether it's uh, the positive side of it <laughs> or the negative, negative side of it, people are passionate about it. Yeah, they've invested time, they've invested emotion. Some people have even invested the skin of their own body, getting tattoos yeah. of Dark Souls stuff, yeah. and it's. People want to have that pay off. Yeah. They want this thing to then come to life, and we we want to make that happen for them too. Yeah. So I hope that all said and done, after those growing pains, after that kind of the labor mm. that that you go through to have this new thing in front of you, that that people are a, as happy with it as we mm. are. How's your? And by the way, how is your tattoo healing? Is it is it okay now? <laughs> I do not have a Dark Souls tattoo yet. I might get You're one, but there it is neither here nor there. You're becoming one of one of us. One of us. I've not got a Dark Souls. I did tattoo. get a Dark Souls T-shirt at Gen Con. Did you? Uh, Estes Flask Ale. Oh, you didn't get the one with like you didn't get the chicken wings. I don't know if you heard about that for the Dark Chicken Wing one. For no, Dark No, no for Dark Souls three. Um, they did like a promotion where you could go into a certain restaurant and you could buy really spicy chicken wings. Oh, gotcha. It was... Yeah, I, I almost got the gym one, except I look like I've never been to a gym. <laughs> and the line on the bottom that says, if you ain't dying, you ain't trying, oh, for goodness just sake. hit a little too close to home yeah, for me, since that's exactly. all I do in Dark Souls. Yeah, I know we're guys in our 40s. I mean, these kind of things become a little bit close to reality. <laughs> kind of thing, yeah, you know yeah. I mean? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> there's been, I mean, would you, knowing what you know now and knowing how the game plays and the community still seems to be vibrant and there's feedback, mm-hmm. when, have you looked at the rules again? Have you, because th- people in Dark Souls like patches and stuff like that, as in, have you thought about right. revisiting the rules or looking revising them or going back through stuff again is that something that's ever kind of occurred to you at all so i think that there are uh, a bunch of different ways to approach this Mm. and in terms of the core rules of the game that we want in the box and what we want them to say i don't know what we would really change if anything yeah uh there are small things that maybe I would change or maybe Alex would change, but I'm not even sure we're 100% in agreement on what those are. Yeah. Uh, Because the core game experience is one way to play the game that tries to hit that fine line that's the right balance between properly appealing to the players who are really into Dark Souls, properly appealing to co-op gamers, to uh, dungeon crawl gamers, board gamers... Uh, just trying to to hit the broadest audience possible. And to do that, it means you're not going to have as refined of an experience for any one particular one of those groups. Um, but we do have a pretty good community uh, of folks who have brought up various ways that they choose to play the game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are lots of ways you can make the treasure deck kind of rigged mm-hmm. to scale mm-hmm. more directly. So that you don't have that experience of finding loot you can't use yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some people would prefer it that way. Some people would rather have the more uh, brutal way of you can find some great new piece of equipment and not be able to use it for a bunch more levels, a bunch more encounters. Um, There's also the speed, the the like grinding nature of it. Uh, Lots of great ways to speed up soul progression if you want uh, and keep the difficulty the same even by reducing the number of souls you have at the start of the game uh, possibly even to zero if you wanted to go just kind of classic old school dungeon crawl yeah knock down the number of sparks you have at the start of the game to nothing so if you die you lose but increase the soul per, uh, amount of souls you get per encounter quite a bit 
uh, possibly add to the number of encounters between bosses, possibly tweak when you do bosses. So many things that you could do to alter the game experience yeah. to more perfectly suit you and your own gaming group, mm -hmm. uh, including so many great expansions coming up soon <laughs> um, for the Kickstarter backers. Uh, they will all have six more characters to experiment with soon. Uh, a bunch more bosses, tons more equipment, uh, just so many new components to play with. Uh, things like mimics, yeah. summons, invaders. And you can craft the ideal Dark Souls experience for you. How does, how We're not going to try and tell you that one particular one is the only right one. Yeah. Uh, it just depends on the group. How do you decide what characters to kind of put in? I mean, is there was there kind of like a a vote between everybody, or was it decided based on the kind of the the additional kind of mechanics that you could bring into the game? I mean, this is this is a question that um, Paddy Smith from Twin Humanities is asking. He's based, that's what he said. Was it you know did you pick out favorites, or did you was it defined by the play mechanics? Um, he's a big fan of the. He's a big fan of the Dark Souls. In fact, he's gone ahead and painted a lot of the, the miniatures, and they look absolutely mm. fantastic. Yeah, I've seen some great looking miniatures that people have painted up mm. and posted online. Ooh. Yeah, and you've got. I mean, the bosses. You've got the bosses. You've got obviously a lot of bosses coming out in the expansions as well. So there's going to be a lot to kind of keep people kind of interested, isn't there? Uh, yeah, another great, great roster of tons of different things to choose from and. <laughs> Uh, we've got a lot already announced. We've got some other ones that we could certainly uh, still do. Yeah. Uh, the nothing says that it's over once these particular things are released. Yeah, I mean, let's face it, you've got you've got enough to keep you going for, well, Dark Souls had three games. <laughs> three games right, and right. multiple kind of DLCs as well. So there's, you yeah. know, everybody's kind of got their own little kind of personal favorite that they would like to, I guess they would like to kind of see out there which you seem to be kind of drip feeding from the different games in terms of the in terms of the bosses itself which is quite which is quite cool uh, as far as the characters go they're mostly just based on uh the dark souls 3 roster right okay we did talk about adding additional characters that are in other mm -hmm. uh iterations of dark souls uh but one of the difficulties there is some of the characters are kind of evolutions of a previous character. Yeah. Or or like a twist on a previous character, or even just a different name. Yeah. Possibly just translated differently from Japanese. Mm -hmm. So it, it was really tough to nail down additional characters for the roster that would not be seen as redundant or just different versions yeah. of something we'd already put out. Yeah. But we definitely had a lot of good discussions about that mm. before deciding on not adding characters. Well, yet. Maybe some day down the road mm. we'll, we'll decide we do still want to do that. Um, but I think it's pretty unlikely just because of that that full, vibrant roster from Dark Souls 3 being our, our go-to. Yeah, we do need to do at least some of the DLC since those are my initials. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm I, I'm I I do I not gonna guess what the L stands for um, because you know it would be um, silly. Um, we have some we have a couple of questions which you know obviously I've mentioned in the green room, so we're not surprising you. Right, right. Uh, but some of them are absolutely fantastic. Um, the the la the question about um, plans working the rules that came from um, Jared uh, Luchev. So thank you for your question. Uh, Ernie Prescott asked the same question. Charles. Uh, Charles uh, Torno asks, "Does the Steam affect the cardboard cardboard at all while you make the games?" Well, that's why we use different production facilities <laughs> for the cardboard versus the plastic See? versus metal miniatures, there you go. Uh, rule books. We've got a whole like bunch of different factories for different things. The Steam Forge factory, we try and keep the cardboard out of there. there you go. <laughs> That's you don't just, want that sounds on like your a, cards that or your sounds boards. like an actual serious development manager type answer <laughs> that somebody would <laughs> somebody would believe. Well, you know, another brief uh, just kind of anecdote from the cabin is on one of the I don't remember if it was the very last day or second to last day, yeah. uh, but Jamie Perkins walked over to me and he said, "I just figured it out. Sometimes when you say something, it's not what you really mean." <laughs> You're being sarcastic, <laughs> but I can't tell with your American accent. Yeah. 
Well, you import and I was speechless. <laughs> I'm sarcastic half the time I'm talking. Well, so you know. he thought I was serious for five days, six know. days. That might not have been ideal. No, you but... you Americans think you invented sarcasm when you had Chandler in oh, from no. Friends, you know, and we've yep. been we've been doing it for years. I'm just you know, I'm just I'm not judging. I'm just you know, stating facts. Uh, we borrow heavily, that's for sure. <laughs> um, Ernie Prescott. Let them know Guild Ball kickoff um, <clears throat> start a box is really awesome. He'd like them to make well, others with different teams. Um, I, I think this is kind of a neat one to talk about in relation to your last podcast, actually. Yeah. You guys were talking about how gaming can be a very expensive hobby, yes. especially miniatures gaming. Yes. Well, if you buy a kickoff, mm. 70 bucks, uh, what, 50 pounds, 55 pounds, yeah, something, something yeah, 50, like that. Yeah. yeah. Something like Two that. whole teams. There you go. You got the Brewers, you got the Masons, you can play each of those teams against your mates. <laughs> Can't go wrong. There you go. That's it. There you go, Ernie. Value for money, that's what you're getting. Um, <laughs> Ivan Paramore, now we need to spend some time on this question. He's asked, um, what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? Uh, African or European? Um, he says he doesn't know. Um and I think that takes care of him. Actually, he's been dragged off screaming into the to the yep. ether, um, off the screen. <laughs> you know, it's it's good that we're answering. Uh, you know, we're answering these kind of serious questions. Yeah, um, the burning questions that the public has. <laughs> uh, Mark McKinnon uh, of Wreck and Rune fame, who's got a Kickstarter coming out in a couple of months. That's just a side plug, but you know, um, he's saying, uh, no, it's good. "When can I get Wave Two, please?" Um. Uh. <laughs> Oh, the, the I, I want person. Wave Two. I want Wave Two out as soon as possible. Uh, yeah. All of the Wave Two content, development-wise, is complete, hmm. uh, but it still has to be made. Like that takes time too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, once, as, as soon as it's produced, as soon as it's uh, shipped to our shipping hubs, uh, we'll, we'll get it to you as soon as we can. But. It's certainly out of my hands at this point. I don't know what date to even try to predict no, yeah. for that. Yeah, it's... But I am very excited. The new characters, uh, the invaders, <laughs> the summons, the new places to explore, all the new treasure. I think people are really going to enjoy it. So many new boss options. It, it's just going to be great. And you're just waiting for people to get hold of this so you can go, haha, I can tell you all about it now. Is it kind of like keeping a well... bit of stuff... A lot, a little bit of intricacies, kind of to your chest. Is it still? Are you wanting it to be kind of like a second Christmas for people when they open up the box? Well, I'm well practiced at keeping secrets by this point, uh, having been uh, development manager at Privateer for so many years, yeah. and now as uh, head of game development at Steam Forged, yeah. kind of in that similar role of knowing lots of things uh, that are secret. But uh, not not giving too much away. But we have started talking a lot about some of the stuff that's going to be in that wave two shipping content. Uh, I, we were just recently able to start talking about the level four encounters. Uh, Alex and I really wanted the mega bosses to be more than just a cool model on the shelf. Yeah. So not only do we have special uh, conditions and rules for every single mega boss, each one has its own unique style and its own customized gameplay we also have another side to the Mega Boss board and cards that allow you to play these big, epic uh, encounters that utilize other models that you own to be able to have this big, final, level four uh, grunt fight before that iconic boss fight. So trying to, to add some more value for folks there mm. as well. Mm -hmm. So that'll answer um, Ian's question, which is release dates, why do they slip kind of thing. Um, he doesn't know. And the thing is, we don't know yeah. yet, you know, it's kind of like, well, it gets to you when it gets to you, but we'd rather put out a proper thing rather than something that you're ultimately not happy with, which is, I guess, what you want Oh, to sure. I mean, that's that's a big part of it, yeah. but why do they slip is, is a huge question, um, and, and it depends so much on what the product is. Mm -hmm. uh, over the course of my whole bunch of years and not, not calling out any particular projects, uh, some projects slip because they simply weren't ready in time. Mm -hmm. Some projects slip because there was a production error and they had to reproduce it. Yeah. Some projects slip, obviously, because we had a problem with translation. Yeah. I think we covered that one already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there can be just so many different reasons, um, and some are a lot more severe than others. 
and companies handle it in different ways. Uh, I I am a big fan of Kickstarter and a big backer of Kickstarter, and it fascinates me to see how differently people approach the same problem. Uh, we had a problem in production, let's say, we're still going to ship you the game, and then we're going to ship you individually a replacement tile for the one that was <laughs> uh, done wrong or something. You know, they can go that route, uh, or it can be... It can just be a flat out delay or they can just send you a product that's not as good as it should be mm. and say, oops, sorry about the production error. That's that's an option, too. Like, there's so many possibilities. Yeah. Or you can have like the warehouse burning down. Like, I think it was one of those Kickstarters. I mean, was it, it wasn't Lisboa or something like that. The warehouse that they had the Kickstarter copies kind of like burnt to the ground. It's like, that's I didn't a hear pretty, that yeah. one. I, I heard about a couple where. The guy with the money kind of ran <laughs> off to an island somewhere, but I hadn't heard about one. Oh where yeah, well the, that's the warehouse um, down. Colin, the co-host with he he pledged for a three D printer on Kickstarter, and uh, the guy kind of went. Um, yeah, um, there's one problem. One of the guys that's part of the company took all the money and bought a house. <laughs> so <laughs> crazy. So that's always pretty good. Um, let's just see. Um, it's kind of. I think the interesting thing is being me being part of kind of a being aware of the community. There are people that kind of like say, I don't like the game and it's not done for me what I expected a Dark Souls board game to do. You know, I've seen people yeah. that have used the kind of the, the kind of I hate it kind of thing. I've seen people that love it. I have people that prefer to play it in groups. I myself actually do a lot of it single player. Oh, I'm glad you said that. Because single player is tough. So many games for single player, they just say, well, play two or three characters on your own and you can play it single player. Mm. That's not the same, no. especially in Dark Souls. No. Um, yeah. So I, I'm i very happy with where we wound up with the single player experience. Mm. Uh, there have been more and more like awards and stuff focused mm. on solitaire gameplay yeah. over just the past five or ten years. It's a growing portion of of the board game audience and the board game market. And I, I would love to see us win some sort of solitaire gaming award. Cause I do think it is a truly enjoyable solitaire experience, not just kind of a make fit of a bigger board game. No, it's definitely tough. I think it's one of these games you go to, if I'm in the, if I'm in the mood for it, for something that's really kind of challenging, then I'll set it up and I'll kind of play through. And uh, cause you have to be really strict to yourself, not just to say, well, that dice roll didn't happen. <laughs> that's thing. true so that's kind of uh, that's kind of interesting um things like you know misprints on cards and stuff like that that people some people have mentioned is that something that you're looking at potentially fixing or is that something that you're um how do you deal with stuff like you know any kind of things like that with the size of the campaign is that something you have to take into consideration or is that something you have to kind of say i've got my hands up here but it's going to cost a lot of money to kind of sort stuff out yeah misprints are tough uh you have things that kind of slip through on on cards mm. or uh on game components and that's not specific to dark souls dark souls we've got 252 cards in there mm. we've got what we've got the wrong icon for for the same consistent error mm. on four of them yeah. and one other minor error like but considering the raw quantity of icons uh or just component like individual elements of a card you're talking about thousands of different things that could have been misprinted in some way <laughs> or another uh and 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 it happens uh not saying that as an excuse we do the best we can in proofing uh the people who do the graphic design work do the best they can in layout we try not to have any errors but Anytime you've got something of that size, uh, a book, uh, a game with that many different elements within it, uh, you're going to have a few yeah. little misses here and there. Uh, and we can provide uh, an errata document, a, a frequently asked questions document to let you know which things w were a minor miss. Mm. But hopefully we keep those very minor. Uh, I know uh, talking about Kickstarter, sometimes you see one where it's like, whoa, they forgot the step called getting your rule book edited. Uh, or, or oh, hey, they <laughs> forgot the step of playtesting the game. Mm. Uh, there, there can be some important elements like that. Yeah. Um, but hopefully, 
the, the few errors we have are fairly small uh, and are, are not something that people are being hindered in their enjoyment of the game. Yeah. Uh, but I do want to come back for just a second to something you said earlier, talking about people who don't enjoy the game as much as others. As broad as we tried to make the game, there are going to people. There are going to be people out there who just don't enjoy it. It's just not for them, and that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's a single uh, board game in existence that every single person who's ever played it has enjoyed. Uh, if there is, that game needs to get some more people playing it because I don't think enough people have ever seen that game. Mm. Um, but any game out there, you're going to have people who like it, people who love it, people who hate it, and that's all right. What's well, a big, we, big uh, expectation? Let's face it. You had, yeah. you decided to take on one of the biggest IPs. Not you. I mean, you. Oh, you, you, can, you can, yeah. But you know, it's like, oh, well, again, you know, you did say yes to the job, so you have to that's take true. some responsibility. Yeah. For your oh, I have to take a lot of responsibility <laughs> for this one and for where it wound up, and and that's all right. Um, but entertainment is just such a subjective medium. Yeah. Uh, we could talk about movies. We could talk about books. We could talk about music, comedy. Uh, people like different things. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. That means there's more room out there for creators. It means there's more of kind of that journey to find the things that appeal most to you. I'm not going to try to convince you to like it if you don't like it. Mm -hmm. You don't like it? Okay. I hope you like other games. And I hope that maybe you... Uh, are able to even within the Steam Forge games lineup find things that you enjoy. Yeah, I mean, um, is there things that you're kind of stepping away from Dark Souls and we'll leave it to for the flame to die and for darkness to take over the world, which is fantastic. Is there games that you're kind of looking forward to at the moment that you've seen that's kind of piqued your interest that says, well, actually, I'm going to get my... You mentioned you are a big Kickstarter backer mm -hmm. so is there any games at the moment that you're like yes i'm gonna get my hands on this and i'm gonna be this is gonna be good fun well uh that could be again a whole nother podcast <laughs> um but there are a lot of games coming out pretty soon because they kind of wanted to hit that gen con window yeah. one of the ones if i'm gonna just pick one yeah. off the top of my head i'm gonna go with uh, heroes of air land and sea Oh, yeah, games. yeah, 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 yeah. The guys who made Tiny Epic Galaxies, mm -hmm. Tiny Epic Kingdoms, Tiny Epic Defenders. Yeah. Uh, they've got a great track record as far as I'm concerned. I've enjoyed a lot of their games. Uh, I got to quickly glance at Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea at Gen Con. Didn't get to do a demo or anything, but it looks very cool. One of the things that just in passing that the, the guy mentioned to me is that the factions in the game play truly differently they all have a unique identity and i love when a game developer can really nail that uh where they can have the characters uh, or the factions or the races or the guilds whatever it may be where they can have each one be unique and be something that can pe people can really attach themselves to and be like oh yeah you know i love the orcs for their aggressive nature or i love the dwarves because i can build the best defenses mm -hmm. being able to just have that differentness as opposed to it just being different colors of plastic. Yeah. Do you um do you frequently play do you go to like game groups yourself or you know, does your wife have you does your wife play? Uh my wife plays a lot. Oh, cool. I believe my wife still has more playtest credits in Privateer Press games than any other female playtester. <laughs> there um, you go. She uh play tested so many different uh, War Machine and Hordes books uh, and various other games. Uh, she also has playtested the Dark Souls card game. Uh, she plays Dark Souls with me. She plays Guild Ball with me on occasion. Yeah. Um, we do greatly enjoy our mechs versus minions that you mentioned oh, earlier. yes. It's so lovely. I can't say I've talked too much about mechs and minions. People are going to think I'm sponsored by Riot Games, but I've been playing a lot with my son and we opened the box. Mm. Have you opened the box yet? Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I've played all the way through oh, it at this point, so and I'm kind of going back through for for another round. Just a second helping, you know. Yep, yeah. If board, if you know, if this, if Mex versus Minions was like, say, jelly and ice cream, I would just be have to be rolled out of the house. <laughs> I would potentially right. be kind of so fat. Um, the Dark Souls card game because we kind of I kind of went 
and then came back and says we'll kind of cover that. Um, there's not an awful lot of time. Um, in fact, there's a potentiality that by the time we this is coming out, that um, anybody that backed the game will have an access to purchase the Dark Souls right. card game. Why? I have the board game DC. Mm-hmm. Why? Why are you trying to thrust a card game on me? You know, I played Eric Lang's Bloodborne. I don't need your Soulsy related cardboard card stuff. Why? Why should right, I think? Right. Of, why should I think about that then? So, part of this question comes back to people liking different games. Yeah. Uh, for folks who are really into kind of. Uh, lengthy, campaigny, in-depth board games, I'm going to tell you straight up, you're probably going to have more fun with Dark Souls the board game than Dark Souls the card game. Mm-hmm. But if you want something that you can play in more 30 to 45 minutes, maybe 60, depending on the number of players, yeah. uh, if you want something that has uh, a, a simpler rule set to explain to new gamers, uh, friends of yours that haven't ever played a bunch of board games but like Dark Souls uh, or maybe just want something that's more of a casual card game for people who aren't even into Dark Souls. This this is more the vehicle for that. I think this is going to be one of those games that appeals to a lot of players. It's what we're calling a deck evolution card game. Oh, all right, okay. Uh, a deck builder card game. You start with a very small deck yeah. and very slowly and gradually build it up to some awesome machine by the end of the game, Uh uh, which is a great genre. I love the deck building genre, but uh, what we've created here, which this deck evolution card game, you start with a decent sized deck and it doesn't change at all on a consistent basis. Mm. But when you hit certain key moments, when you go back to the bonfire, you have the opportunity to substantially change your deck, uh, retool it, get uh, better cards into that deck. And so you have kind of that that cool role-playing-ish element, deck buildery element of saying, oh, now I'm a lot stronger. Now I'm a lot more capable of facing the challenges before me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is it kind of, I mean, there's only, I guess there's only two things that I have trouble with in a Dark Souls board game. The first thing is is that on single player it can still take me two or three hours to get through a scenario depending on how I'm playing because I'm quite slow. Right. Secondly, the only other thing is the storage of those cards drives me up the wall. I'm not going to say anything more about it because otherwise my eye will start twitching. But the tray with the cards. Right. It slides and slips about. And then I have to organize it. Yeah, yeah. And it's a little bit frustrating. But I've made my peace with it by putting things in little plastic bags so that kind of keeps everything together. Yeah, I have my my small little uh, fishing box sort of thing (laughs) for all the all the tokens and the dice and I've got my various little baggies for all the cards. Mm. Uh, it is a game with a lot of components and figuring out how best to store them can be a bit of a challenge. Um, this game, the card game, yeah. does have some tokens right. and some board mm-hmm. sort of sort of components, but other than that, it's just cards. Um, so if you've got a few spare deck boxes lying around, it, that'd be an easy way to do it. Oh, cool. Um, and I don't know exactly what the final uh, box is going to look like, yeah. so it might even have some some superior ways to keep cards separated into different types of cards mm. or different characters cards cool. uh, already i'm not sure yeah so um wait how can people get hold of it bearing in mind if we say that you know um as per just now the backer kit is potentially closed how are people going to be able to get hold of the game is it going to be going out is it going to be going out to retail release is it going to be a steam forged kind of only kind of game you can get through there what's the kind of the channels to market that you're going to be doing with it so we are not doing a Kickstarter. We're already well past uh, the stage in development where Steamforge usually does their Kickstarters. Yeah. That whole gauging interest, yeah. uh, kind of building the rules as we go. Mm-hmm. Uh, the rules are very nearly done. Mm-hmm. Um, they just We're in the proofing stage right now. Mm-hmm. So it will go direct to retail. Is this, uh, is this a risk? Be, a bit? 
Um, I don't think so. No. I, I think that we have a we have a strong relationship with our distributors, yeah. with our retailers, and with our community, where people will uh, try out this game, tell their friends. I it, we're we're asking, is it a risk to follow the business model that? everyone had to use not too too <laughs> exactly. long ago in our yeah. gamers history yeah. um so we, we, we're confident in the product and it is a a lower risk product anyway since it is just cards and some cardboard component yeah much lower price point yeah uh it's always a, more of a risk when you talk about that kind of big box investment mm-hmm. uh rather than just kind of uh, a card game that you pick up and play with friends. Or like that one looks cool. Let's give it a try. Okay. Or oh, I liked dying a hundred times. Let's try Dark Souls, the card game. Yeah. And you just drop down. Uh, I think it's going to be thirty pounds. I'm not hundred percent sure on that, but something like that, thirty or thirty five. Okay. A much lower investment. Uh, I know people who spend more than that on Starbucks every week. Yeah, there are those, and you've just obviously. I'm just trying to persuade myself that I don't need another card game in my life, but that's currently failed with that um, little pitch that you did there so thank you so much yeah for you do need this one <laughs> I yeah. do need that there you go <laughs> it's almost like you have the interest of the company in <laughs> at heart there um, I also just really love to see people playing with these things I've created yeah um, the we we talked about the the convergence of Cirrus faction yeah. for War Machine and how I had a lot of involvement in that and just was so proud of that when it was done. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they the, somebody playing that particular faction uh, just won a, a big War Machine event at Gen Con and it was like, oh, that's really cool, you know. <laughs> so just Did people you? being able to to take it and then enjoy it. Oh, I tried out such and such a game yeah. and my son loved it or. Uh, I showed my girlfriend this game on our first date. Like those kinds of things are are just fantastic. Did you get a little bit? Did you go like, oh look, somebody's been cutting onions in here. There's a little kind of, or there's dust. Did somebody right. been dusting in here? Because I, I, yep, yep. <laughs> Especially <laughs> you the, understand. Yeah, I got it. You know, it's my baby kind of thing. Um, the next project, and we'll, um, you know, we've been talking a while, and I really appreciate the time you've given us so far, but, um. You've gone for another video game IP and a a, a pretty big one, I must admit. Yeah. You know, Resident Evil Two, and I'm not expecting you to give us any exclusives or any kind of information that hasn't been released um, to general public. DC, I need this information. Um, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, was that one that you, I mean? That's a that is big. I mean, that is. I would say that's almost as big with a love as the Dark Souls kind of series as well. Um, there's characters that you're bringing in that are going to be playable. Um, this is yeah. a question from Paddy because this is the final question that he was asking. He says that Leon and Claire are obviously playable. Um, right. Have you thought about other characters? Are you able to say about any other characters at all? Um, so one one thing I can say is that the license for this exact board game mm. is limited to Resident Evil Two. Okay, uh, kind of the the core release, the core storyline stuff from that particular game. Right. Uh, so characters from other entries in the series won't be part of this game. Yeah. Um, but we certainly have the room to then do a different entry in the Resident Evil series at some point in the future. Oh, that's so... Ex- four. <laughs> has to be four. Yeah, is that I'm the one t- you like oh, best? Yeah. I think it's... Yeah. yeah. People will disagree, but four's my... Yeah, four's my boy. I really liked four. It was one of my favorite well, games for, for a while. One of the ones that's going to be tricky about Resident Evil is that not every game in the series uh, is quite the same in terms of the, the feel of it. Yeah. Like Resident Evil 2 is very survival horror. Yes. Uh, you are not going to be running and gunning and blowing a ton of zombies' heads off. No. Uh, that's not the, the feel of the video game. That's not the feel we're going to be emulating in the board game. Mm-hmm. It is going to be more of a conserve your health, conserve your ammo. All right. Get what you need to get accomplished in order to survive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some of the other games in the series, you are a little bit more of a badass. 
uh, than in Resident Evil 2 anyway. Yeah, I think the thing with the Resident Evil games is that you can end up being kind of like the super-powered muscle man just going about blowing kind of everything up. Um, I think that was what was... I think the the latest game in the franchise got kind of labelled with that towards the end that you just basically became like John Rambo in terms of the, right. <laughs> the equipment that you were kind of handling. So this is going to be more different. I mean, because you had the kind of the mechanics, the different mechanics to deal with the Dark Souls type of the game, have you gone... Have you purposefully gone for different mechanics when you've been approaching Resident Evil 2? Or have you gone a more traditional kind of kind of traditional kind of route with a kind of movement and things like that? So Resident Evil Two has the Kickstarter still upcoming. Ah, uh, it's still a, a month or so out. Yeah, and hopefully you guys will all watch for it. But because of that, and because of the model that Steam Forge uses, there are certain elements of the game that are still kind of a uh, work in progress. We've right. got certain things kind of nailed down, or at least uh, temporarily nailed down. Um, but once we have that Kickstarter going, we see what exactly is going to be in the box, what what stretch goals do we hit, What what is the final landscape of this product. Yeah. We'll have to go off and possibly in a cabin in England somewhere again. We'll see. Uh, and, You're looking and forward to And figure out that. all of those details. <laughs> Well, I I always pitch to have it here. Yeah, you got to watch. I, I, I say you should just come to my house. <laughs> Do you know it would be funny if they had the cabin out in the woods, and then halfway through the weekend, in the middle of the night, they actually got some cosplayers to come in as zombies. Oh wow! Yeah, that'd be pretty pretty hardcore. That'd right be there. inspirational, wouldn't it? <laughs> that would inspire. I'm worried. Oh right. It's not America. I was thinking, if, it, if that happened in the United States, I'm worried someone would get shot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you can imagine that. Man, there'd be zombies out there. Gear my shotgun. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that's an American accent, huh? That's not, no, that's, you know. <laughs> Redneck. <American laughs> so. Yeah. I got a lot of them. <laughs> oh, my goodness. As if I just j- j- jump into the ultimate trope there. I've got a lot of American <laughs> friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh dear. Yeah, that is a danger, isn't it? Come round to my house, and then what happens is they do a zombie thing, and it's like you shot Darren. <laughs> you could die. I hate when that happens. <laughs> well, Darren deserves it. He's not the nicest man in the book. Um, <clears throat> so you're going to do the cabin thing, and it's going to be like a mind mesh thing, and you're going to have ideas. Yeah, flight flying and we out. We and... have demos at Gen Con. Yeah, um, there are elements of the game that are already pretty fixed yeah. uh rather than the node movement of dark souls we are using more traditional squares yeah uh spaces on a board uh the tile shape uh at least as long as we stick with what we've got now mm. is going to be different tile shapes kind of put together to form the actual layouts of things that you'd experience mm-hmm. in resident evil 2 mm-hmm. uh you've got a more traditional action system uh, it is kind of meant to be uh, a bit more uh, accessible in terms of reading the rule book and jumping in in a quicker amount of time than Dark Souls. Also a, a lower price point, but then with that, of course, there's fewer miniatures. Um, just kind of trying to make it a, a bit more mainstream in its presentation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cool. I mean, um, are you... Here's this question. With you in your direction and you moving down the board game path, and obviously this the kind of the IPs, and it sounds like this could be Steamforge's bag. Um, I see a lot of kind of IPs seem to be getting turned into board games now. I mean, Rambo is getting yeah. turned into a board game. Total Recall, um, which yeah. I saw that, then I forgot what it was about. Um, and <laughs> nice. There you go. Yeah, and the the Total Recall one, uh, that is just a very small group. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. Just a, a little indie studio. Yeah. They've done some some cool social games. Um, it, I am fairly certain they're the guys who made uh, New Salem, mm. which is a great little game. If you haven't tried that out, uh, it, th- there's so many great little companies out there doing doing their thing yeah. making cool games yeah. even even picking up ips and trying their hand at that mm. 
entertainment as a whole is just becoming so much more integrated. Yes. Uh, you pick certain things. Like, let's take, as an example, Batman. You've got uh, comic books, TV show, movies, video games, uh, like uh, app games, board games, miniatures game. Like, it, it's it's a whole thing. It's all connected. Uh, game of Thrones. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, pick an IP... These days, it's not necessarily a one medium IP. Yeah. It can be spread out through all different realms of entertainment. Would you go back to wargaming then? Is there is there game designs? Have you got the kind of the little DC book of game designs I'd like to make that you would? Oh yeah, that you would one day. I mean, is there still? Would you still like to go back to? producing the kind of the war game inside of stuff. I mean, have you seen, have you exposed yourself at all to kind of like Dark Imperium and what they're doing with the 40k kind of universe? So I, there's a lot of different types of gamers out there. Mm. Uh, and, and I have a lot of different avenues that all appeal to me. There's parts of me that like the power gamer thing, yeah. parts of me that like the social thing. Uh, there's a big part of me that likes that collector element, mm-hmm. the gotta catch them all sort of feeling. Uh, and I've got somewhere in the range of 50 to 75 game ideas that I would love to do. Wow. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not going to get around to all of them. Some are nothing but a title, yeah. while others are fully fleshed out and kind of almost ready to... Well, one of them even has a lot of the artwork already done. Yeah. So it, it just depends on which of my various game ideas. And I know they won't all get made. That's all right. Mm. Uh, we actually had a game that was called match day yeah it was in the guild ball universe Uh that i was uh starting to develop that as a card game that would come after uh the shadow games card game Uh so kind of bridge the gap between uh casual bluffing card game of shadow games and the more in-depth experience of guild ball and kickoff uh this was going to be kind of a very guild ball e a card game uh, and we wound up deciding not to make it for a variety of reasons and some of the ideas from that some of the elements of that eventually morphed into the certain elements of dark souls the card game oh that's cool so e- even an idea that dies for lack of a better term for it can can still have new life someday some of the mechanics can still be useful some of the uh the core elements can still be fun mm. Uh, and and yeah, I've got I've got lots of games I'd I'd love to make someday. <laughs> well, you never know from all different genres too. Yeah, from from the mini- hobby miniatures gaming that you were talking about. Um, I've got a, a social or a, a party game I want to make. I want to make more kids games. I want to make more board games. Just all of it. All of it. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a firm sail and a strong wind. Basically. Right, right. <laughs> but the most, imp- I mean, one of the questions that, um, and this is a rubbish question, but I ask any- everybody it because you've got to have at least one rubbish question, especially since everything I've been asking has been pure gold this evening. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's Resident Evil based as well. Okay. okay. You're in the middle of a zombie ac- apocalypse, DC. Mm-hmm. You stumble into a shop, and it appears to be a board game shop. You okay. have a choice of three games you can take with you mm. out into the zombie apocalypse, okay? Just to take to play, to enjoy, to experience All with right. others. Every single board game's there. It doesn't matter the size, it doesn't matter if it's out of print, it doesn't matter if it kind of has all the... You, you can have access to any expansions. You can carry any number of games that you have, but you have a choice of three, and you have a trolley, what three? Okay. What three games would you take with you? Yeah, I, th- I think I would need a trolley because <laughs> I would. Uh, e- even just saying Max versus Minions and Dark Souls, I'm already at what about ten kilos. Yes, you are. <laughs> so so I need I need that trolley. All right. Okay. Ah, uh, what would I pick for the third though? Yeah, There's I know. so many good choices. I know. I. Well, and I don't know how many people I'm going to find to play with. So well, that, you can, that, that doesn't to... matter. You're going to find small. Right. In, you're going to find small individual guys who are loners and are just 
forging their own path, trying to get back to their families. But you're going to end up in communities where you have, you can have up to as many people as you need. And guess what? When you say to people, I'd like to pay a, play a board game, they all turn around and instantly smile at you and say, yes, I want to play one too. What do you got? So yeah, don't I mean, they've got nothing else going on. So exactly, I, I'm going to say one I mentioned, another one I mentioned earlier in the show, which is New Salem uh, by Overworld Games. Um, it's got uh, a lot of cool elements to it: drafting, bluffing, uh, social elements. So uh, something nice and diverse as my third pick, since I've got some crunchier miniatures-based games already on my trolley. And those minis are so crunchy. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um. Listen, thank you very much for coming on. I've kind of talked to you an awful lot longer than I expected to just because I was like, this is DC. I don't want to keep him too long. So I appreciate you yeah. spending oh, we so had a good much chat. time. Um, if people have listened and they want to keep their hands within the Steam Forge universe, where's the best place they can maybe find you and where's the best place to find Steam Forge? So uh, the Steam Forge Games website is a great place to go. It's got new announcements. Mm. It's got its own forums. Mm-hmm. Uh, so definitely check that out. Uh, for me personally, I, I don't post all the time. But if you go on Facebook and uh, follow Clockwork Phoenix, mm-hmm. I'll occasionally have some updates through that and let you know kind of what things I've got going on, uh, the 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 Dark Souls card game's coming out real soon. The the card game I mentioned from Ninja Division uh, is called Rainbow Knights. It's right. my first ever kids game. Okay. Uh, so that one's coming out soon. So uh, I'll do occasional updates on there. So feel free to to follow Clockwork Phoenix on Facebook. Well, I will make sure that we put um, links in the show notes so that we have notes. Sounds good. We have notes to show. That's what we do. Um, if you want to keep an eye on what we're doing, and we appreciate everybody who does, each and every one of you little Dark Souls people, um, you can find us on Twitter if you search for We're Not Wizards on Facebook, We're Not Wizards. You can go to YouTube and if you search for We're Not Wizards Tabletop, you'll find us there. And um, We're on all the places you can get a podcast, your Stitcher, your Spreaker, your Acast, Mixcloud all these wonderful different places um, you can email us which is magic at we're not wizards yes I am aware of the irony of the email address I had it <laughs> in mind when I picked it um, if you like what you've heard tonight um, we want more people to learn about this show because we have cracking guests like DC and one of the ways to do that is if you jump onto Apple Podcasts because apparently they are the centre of the wonderful universe and if you drop a subscription, which is always good, and then you'll be able to hear for the next, the previous 90-odd jokes which have been repeated ad infinitum. But you can drop us a subscription, as I said, or you can leave us a review. If you do leave us a review, don't give us a 10, because that makes us big-headed. But don't give us a, wo- <laughs> don't give us a 1, because that will make us cry. Leave us a 5, you know, something in the middle. Because mm. that's average. And we are... We're a little bit average. But the person who hasn't been average tonight is the emperor of board game design. Oh, oh <laughs> <laughs> Lord Vader, rise. Um, the fantastic <laughs> Mr. Mr. DC, Mr. Dave Carl. Thank you very, very much for coming on. It's been it's been oh, wonderful. Thank you for having me. I had a lot of fun <laughs> chatting with you tonight. Oh, excuse me, chatting to you tonight. I'm not <laughs> no, in the US. No, no. As, as we as we like to say in here, it's your night, and and the the topics are yours, <laughs> and it's all it's all very very good. There are only two more things to do. The first thing is to remember that we are many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, DC? No. Absolutely not. We are um we are the ashen ones. <laughs> we are tonight we are for tonight. sure, yeah. <laughs> and the um the second thing is to say goodbye. So it is um it's a goodbye from the thoroughly interesting and all round wonderful man, um that's David Carl. Say goodbye, David. Good night everyone, take care. And it's a goodbye from me. 
remember, um, stay safe, roll sixes. Um, check out the Dark Souls card game. And for all those who have backed the Dark Souls board game, I heard the expansions are very, very tasty and very, very mm-hmm. good. And if you've rather got an appetite for brains, if you wait for a couple of months, there will be a Kickstarter that will probably be right up your alley. But until the next time, goodbye. <laughs>